Oh. Any moment oh. now. Boo, Take us home, Troy. Here we go. It's I don't even have a song. I should probably think of one. We need yeah, a we need, song, I think. Yeah, we do need a theme song. We mm. were gonna get uh, Alex to make us a little opening theme graphic. Oh, we, we need should, to yeah. do that. We really do. Um, His rates are very reasonable. Oh, there yes. we go. We're live. Yay. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome Hi. to Mutants and Masterminds Monday. It is our our daily connection to all things Mutants and Masterminds, but I know why you're really here. You, It's, it's not for me. It's not for Crystal. It's not for Steve. It's for Liz. Now I'm going to screw this last name up because I am freaking out. Listen, Liz, I'm angry. Liz Liddell. You got it. I'm, I am angry because <laughs> Crystal and Steve did not warn me that we were having a superstar on today. And I literally almost missed this entire stream because I was just going through your history of the of writing and your your you write, you play music, um, you are a you are a certified marriageologist. Um, you <laughs> You invented post-it notes. I mean, you have this laundry list of amazing accomplishments, and you're also a dear friend of ours. Um, really glad to have you here. And of course, they're here for you, Crystal, and they're here for you as well, Steve. Um, it's Mutants and Masterminds Monday, and this is a really killer one. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Crystal, while I, uh, I don't know, fan myself or something. <laughs> I can get you some post-it notes Wait. for that. Please, right. please. <laughs> Oh, there oh, we yeah, go. I forgot, I forgot this part. Um, folks, uh, as I kind of get uh, gather myself, um, drop your questions in the chat and we will um, endeavor to answer them or ignore them as we wish. Um, oh, it looks like some people are having a problem loading and I can't oh, oh. tell if, oh, nope, I see us. And never mind. <laughs> um, okay, and I will now be quiet. So yeah, uh, Liz, we're having you on this week because you are the author behind the newest installment of Nether War, which comes out later this week, uh, Broken Strings. Uh, but this is not the first <laughs> Mutants and Masterminds adventure you've written for us. You also wrote Power Play, which is the adventure in the new Deluxe Game Master's Guide. Uh, you've been working in the RPG industry for years and years at this point. Uh, you are a full-time game designer as well as a freelancer. Uh, would you like to tell us about your your amazing career? Well, sure. Um, I honestly hearing all of these things about me is odd because I, I started working in RPGs as an editor, and I still deep down think of myself as an editor first. Uh, I, editing was how I got involved um, with the D twenty system way back in the three point five heyday. Uh, it's how I landed my first freelance gigs working with Paizo Publishing. Uh, they turned into a full-time editing gig, um, and that's just, uh, you know, doors have been opening since then, uh, letting me sort of feel out other uh, other opportunities. Um, and, and one of the most really, like, zany, fun ones has been here working on Mutants and Masterminds, because it is just such a fun system and such a fun setting to write for. Oh, you're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, really, they're really, really good at this. And I got to tell you, the chat is also very excited. I, I'm in a little bit of trouble because they definitely want to make sure that they, that uh, Crystal and Steve know that they're here for you too. Oh. Like I said as much, come on. Um, uh, real quickly, you know, you are also, you're a classically trained musician. That's correct. Um, what, you know, you play a lot of things. I do. So uh, I will preface all of this with don't get degrees in classical music. They're really not very useful. Um, that said, I have a master of music in bassoon performance. Bassoons are the big, long bedpost looking woodwinds you see in the symphony. Mm -hmm. With a little uh, tube on the top. The little, little tube metal. on the top. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I don't, playing a bassoon gives you a certain innate sense of humor because you just can't play one and take yourself very seriously because it's just a ridiculous instrument. I play more keys with my thumbs than all of my fingers put together. Who builds an instrument like that? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's my education. Um, and from there, I, I've spread out into um, early music, Renaissance, medieval, and Baroque music. Uh, where I specialize on recorder. Um, I've, if, you're, if you're watching, I have a couple of recorders um, always out for practice times, um, but I dabble in a lot of other instruments. So I've been uh, spending some quarantine time learning piano. It's really hard. So anybody who plays piano, major props to you. I, it, I can't wrap my brain around it. 
Um, and, uh, and then some odd things like this viola da gamba that you can see here behind me. And I may be um, uh, conflating a couple different uh, conversations that we've had on the road to getting us uh, on the stream, um, but uh, cosplayer as well. I've done a couple of costumes at conventions. Yes, I don't. I, I don't know that I'm. A, I would call myself a cosplayer, but maybe a cosplay dabbler. Okay. Okay. I like that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, are we missing anything else? Uh, well, we could we could let the the cat out of the box, or I don't. Uh, I think it's yeah. Put the cat yeah, in the box. So your your day job is uh, working as a game designer on Pathfinder Second Edition. That's mm. that's correct. I've been doing that for uh, not quite a year now. Um, I, I joined the design team shortly after we launched uh, the second edition of the Pathfinder role-playing game, um, partly because uh, having been a, an editor and developer as we were producing that book, um, I just really came to love the system. Um, I found it to be very flexible. I found it to be um, all the things I love about a D20 system without a lot of the fiddly little minutia that the first edition had built up over the years. Um, so uh, I've been... I have been now learning my way around design and it's been a whole heckin interesting experience. Um, you know, that apparently like nine months in, I'm starting to feel like I maybe know what I'm doing. What's it like? Uh, oh boy, um, real ultimate power mixed with crushing despair and fear of deadlines. Oh, well then I must oh. be an expert. So not that different then. <laughs> oh, yeah, not really. <laughs> so, I love yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> We've got uh, Alex Thomas. We were just uh, speaking of you, Alex. Um, uh, Alex says, you see, in trumpet players have the opposite problem of bassoons. We take ourselves way too seriously for the instrument we play. I would say <laughs> trumpet players and the saxophone guys. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. They are see, real. Here's the thing about trumpet players, though. If you're playing a trumpet, everyone knows it. And so you have to, there's a level of self-awareness there that I think you have to maintain because you, you know, you, if, if you're going to bungle up on a trumpet, everyone's going to know it. Through that. And if you're playing yeah, but, a sack, they're like, do you see me? Huh? How about now? How about now? <laughs> I'm in your face. Are you in a date? I'm in a date? Yeah. Like, like, Rats are store. not a subtle family. Right? <laughs> yeah. True facts. No. I'm just waiting for the bus. Bold, <laughs> bold as brass is an expression for I, a reason. <laughs> true that. <laughs> oh, hey. I'm just putting that together. See, we learn all kinds of things here. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, everybody, as, as per the usual, they are sharing links to all of our backgrounds and background <laughs> checks and all Oh, that. no. <laughs> right. I think um, my credit score is okay. No, yeah, it looks like you're doing pretty oh, my good. Our viewers terrible. will find out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it looks like we're all doing pretty good. Um, uh, okay, so oh, this is interesting. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak this in. Uh, Brian Scott Bailey says, okay, best in instrument to uh, use as a bard in your opinion, and why? Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, ooh. Well, I mean, the classic answer is always the lute. Every bard ever is is depicted carrying a lute, but I think that's a really inconvenient instrument because it needs two hands, right? You can't play a lute mm -hmm. with one hand, otherwise you're playing a weird open chord all the time. So <laughs> like, I don't know, anything you can play one hand, I think I'm gonna go out on a limb and go with a tabor pipe. Um, because the pipe and tabor combo is a, a specific drum known as a tabor. And then this bizarre pipe that you can play with only three fingers. So you have your other hand free to hang on to your short sword and stab people. <laughs> I can't argue with that. Right? Oh, that's, a, that's a solid instrument. Um, uh, Crystal and Steve, you have a thought? Oh gosh, on bard instruments? Yeah. I, well, or, or just what, you know, if you're going to be a bard in a, and you're going to be playing that role in the context mm -hmm. of a role-playing game, because I was going to mm -hmm. say a theremin. <laughs> <laughs> but then you need a power supply. So are you like, are right. you just like cranking your own it, generator at all times? Is it like a, is it like a magical theremin? Yes. You know? mm, there you go. <laughs> what about a, like a hurdy gurdy? Yeah, What's a hurdy gurdy? Go. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> hurdy gurdy is like, uh, like it's a medieval grinder. instrument that you, not quite an organ grinder, but yeah, like, but not quite. It's got keys yeah. you play. It's You're not right. just running through a pre recorded it's sort song. Sort of that and, a, and an accordion almost. Y yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the answers here are really good. Um, this one, uh, Randall Cram says a kazoo. Um, oh, good. Awesome. Yep. Also sure. one-handed. Classic yep. bard's uh, uh, instrument. A liar, because they're all liars anyway. Um, Ooh, you know yeah. a bard. That's good. I like the that. The problem is, uh, all the bards I play are, like, dramatic performance-focused. Oh, I'm so not... I guess I'm projecting as a drama kid, but... Oh, uh, Randall <laughs> Cram says, or the pipe organ. 
which <laughs> the least practical like, part it's, ever. It's, yeah. it imp- it's, it's inconvenient to carry around, but it does do 3d8 damage. <laughs> it does leave an impression, though. I love it. 90% of the adventure is just getting the thing out the door. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love uh, then Jay Gray says only one limb though, so okay. Uh and then Nathan Kaler says bagpipes. Um mm-hmm. there we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yes. that's a, that's a good one. Bard. That's good stuff. Uh and then you know, um Jay Gray coming in with the uh practical a harmonica. A, a, <laughs> sorry, and a harmonica. A har- and harmonica but has anyone work. ever found uh, a harmonica inspiring? Can be done without hands, he says. So mm, that's good. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. I guess if you Dick get like the thing that, like, that. yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, that was a, a very um, nice walk down uh, Bard Lane. Uh, I'm interested in hearing a bit about sort of the things we've got cooking and sort of what's in the pipeline. Can we uh, elaborate on some of that? Yeah. Uh, well. Liz, we've got you on this week to talk a little bit about Broken Strings. Uh, So those of you following the Nether War along at home, you know that strange doings are afoot. Uh, We were talking last month about Steve's adventure uh, where you chased down uh, uh, Hell Queen and have to recover a bunch of talismans that Eldritch enchanted to try and protect Earth from an evil, corrupt master mage taking over the world and Liz with your adventure you start to find some some mysteries and clues about who the evil master mage trying to take over the world is do you want to get into some details about your favorite parts or the the overall plot sure I mean I guess the overall plot is uh is kind of maybe the best place to start um I will try to do this without spoilers and stick to themes Mm. Uh, but you mentioned that in the last adventure um the heroes are starting to encounter talismans and starting to like get a hint of this larger scale um threat that they're that they're coming up against and broken strings is the adventure where that kind of goes from like okay we're following leads there's stuff happening to starting to see the pieces of that falling into place um so you're starting out with an exploration of more of these talismans you're finding uh individual examples of them uh in a couple of different places um and and putting the clues together to figure out what who, what's behind it and and sort of what's what's happening um, and through the course of the adventure, you realize that the talismans are all leading up to one final point, which is uh, not just a talisman, but also uh, someone. Uh, mm. And that that someone is going to have a uh, much larger role to play in the adventures that follow this one. So it's kind of the pivot point where you're where you're following the breadcrumbs but starting to, you know, you're starting to look through the keyhole and see the bigger picture that's happening beyond. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's safe for us to to spoil who the villain in the story is because he's on the cover of the adventure. Oh, uh, that's fair. This is this is a toy mm-hmm. boy adventure. This is, um, and and broken strings, of course, is um, despite my musical background, not referring to a, a string <laughs> instrument, but in fact, puppet strings. Um, mm-hmm. Where we're uh, exploring sort of like all of the all the different creatures that Toy Boy is animating and controlling, uh, which really makes for just a stinking fun adventure, I have to say. Yeah, um, I was it's... really impressed by what you came with came up with for the boss fight. Oh, we had <laughs> it was a, it was a lot of fun. It's like uh, it, it's like getting this adventure outline and saying, okay, go to your toy box and open it up and see what you've got. And what do you want to play with? Um, and it's mm-hmm. it's all on the table. Um, so we have, you know, if you've ever wanted to have an epic encounter with some silly putty, we've got that. Uh, <laughs> you ever wonder what happens uh, if the, uh, uh, you know, the little plastic army soldiers come alive by the thousands? Uh, mm-hmm. We've got that too. Um, I am a, a personal lifelong fan of Transformers. Uh, and so I'm very excited that we have some giant transforming robots in a, in a ridiculous um, chase turned running street fight uh, to open up the adventure. And it was it was completely accidental that I assigned you like the adventure with Transformers mm. in it. But I am so happy that lined up. It was great. Uh, I've, I have now. I now feel as though I have gotten to make my own transformers in the world, which is uh, which is very. It's very nice. A lot of fun. I have a question for all three of you. Um, one of the things that I've noted as we've kind of embarked on this adventure of inviting creators to come hang out with us and sort of have these conversations, really engaging and fun conversations. Uh, do you? I, 
I, I have found that we discover these accidental sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, synergies or things we didn't necessarily plan for, but the pieces mm -hmm. fell into place. And it was like, aha, I couldn't have planned that better. And then sort of anything that you kind of try to grasp and sort of, you know, wrestle into submission ends up saying, nope, <laughs> you know, and uh, so uh, um, is that, what is that about? Is that about like a connection at the, at the, you know, at the point of sort of the genesis of these ideas or the relationships as they begin or, or is it, are we just working with magic? Well, I mean, isn't that just a great metaphor for role-playing games in general? Uh, yeah. You know, where all of the all the really best stuff is is just these amazing synergies that arise out of the process of playing the game, and mm -hmm. all of those things that you are just like, this is going to be my masterpiece moment that you just invest tremendous amounts of effort yep. into building, the players will just completely <laughs> blow past it and ruin it within two minutes. And with know. glee. Yeah. With glee. And then go somewhere else that you right. never then, expected them to go. <laughs> right. Yep. You know. That is I mean, one of the challenges of making adventures for this system. <laughs> so, so it gives it gives me a certain sense of, you know, a security that it, on, on the creative end of things, it's not all that different. You know, and I think that that's one of the one of the things that's remarkable about uh, our industry is we are so connected to the player, uh, even as you know, sort of creators working for publishers and sort of doing mm -hmm. this work full time. Um, we're we're not that far removed from the experience of just sort of playing in these worlds. Um, mm -hmm. Liz, do you get a lot of chance to to play um, now that you're kind of? Uh, I mean, you, you're full time you've game gone pro. Yeah. Yeah, you gone pro. Are you a pro? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, the... not as much as I used to. Um, I, I uh, before I was doing this full time, I was I was spending probably three or four nights a week gaming or in game related activities. Um, now that I do it full time, I I have I'm down to two. One game that happens pretty much every week, and one game that happens like maybe one or two out of three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And that's I feel like that's that's kind of hitting a, a better balance for me because for some degree it is now that it's my day job it's also work it's like i'm always play testing everything mm -hmm. yeah yeah you're yeah. the downside kind of, of going yeah. pro in this industry is you can't turn it off yeah yeah yeah, like, yeah. yeah. how would i have paced this right. <laughs> those gears just grind for sure i'm uh, checking our <laughs> chat real quick and i am seeing here that we before we get some... into chat i just also yes, want to compliment liz for putting in like I want to say three of my favorite encounters that we've had so far in an astonishing adventures. Uh, I will only call out one in that it, because it involves somebody being mauled by inflatable sharks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that goes back to opening up the toy chest and seeing yeah. what's in it. Mm -hmm. Like inflatable pool floaties, right? Like right. they're not going to hurt anyone until they start to pull you apart. <laughs> <laughs> this is why Toy Boy is such a fun villain. Right. <laughs> Especially now that he's a creepy undead ghost. Mm -hmm. There are some comments here I do not understand, so I will not read them um, <laughs> for fear of, you know, whatever. Okay. Uh, so we'll err on the, uh, you know, discretion, the better part of valor, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> You're smarter man than I, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> not generally. Um, <laughs> Uh, Apuk says, uh, some of us have already had an epic encounter with Silly Putty. Um, uh, we'll yeah. To, yeah, we may, may need to unpack that later. Um, <laughs> <We're that's, not. laughs> that's what therapists are for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, better, better than, yeah. We are I, in no way qualified. <laughs> no, we're all absolutely not qualified. Uh, yeah, we're qualified enough to know we are not qualified. Um, Jay Gray says, oh, this is my favorite. I'm, I just want to read this just because it's just sort of one of those fun moments. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jay, Gray, uh, Jay Gray says, from the outside, it seems that as you create in the, Steve completely took my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I love Hi, it. John. I love it. Um, yeah, and the other comments here, I'm not sure who we are talking about or if they are good or bad people, so I'm not going to mention their names. Um, but okay. uh, but uh, remember, if you have some questions or some thoughts on the topic that we are um, uh, discussing mm. that involve the names of the people who are here. Um, mm. Do uh, do share them, and I will read them. 
So Liz, Crystal mentioned that one of the challenges of uh, designing for mutants and masterminds in particular is just the tremendous range of things that characters can do. Um, and you really don't know who the heroes are going to be. Uh, so how do you address that when you're doing your uh, encounter design? That's a really great question. I think that is is the biggest difference between what I usually write and what I'm usually designing and, and working in this space. It's just the, um, you know, you never know what the PCs are going to do, but now mm -hmm. I don't even know what the PCs are going to be capable of yeah. um, right. because it's so open-ended. And I, and I love that. I love how much that lets <laughs> players bring, you know, build exactly the hero they want to see at the table. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it means that in designing encounters, um, I have to think a lot more open-ended and think less in terms of pathways and more in terms of, um, I don't want to say like, like clues and mm -hmm. doors. Um, so, you know, what, what are they going to see and what are the ways they can get from point A to point B? Uh, you know, so I, so I'm going to put a couple of clues in point A and I'm going to have a couple of different routes that they might take to get to point B um, and then give the GM enough information that they know what's going on and can make the decisions about what their players are trying to do based on the information that they have about, about what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think that's, that's the best tool set that I can give to someone running an adventure, uh, especially a pre-written adventure when the entire world is so open-ended. Mm. Mm -hmm. So as the so the three of you sort of being responsible for uh, the the keepers of the canon, as we look at so uh, you know Sean Vieira says so Toy Boy is following DC's Toyman's example and becoming creepy as time goes on. Cool, yeah, and he's answered that with cool. Um, so, but my my question though is when you so you're working with people who are. Uh, across the, you know, sometimes across the globe, you're sharing concepts and ideas that we kind of mm -hmm. share sort of in a, in a, uh, a shared experience kind of way through entertainment and just sort of pathos and the whole thing. Um, my question for the three of you is how do you balance the evolution of these, like, does that evolution of these villains and these characters in this world, is that something that you kind of talk about and then push that way? Or is is like, Crystal, do you say, okay, time to make it crazy or, or crazy or, or, or does it just sort of happen as a natural kind of uh, sort of outcome? Uh, well, a lot of the changes to the, the default setting happened before I was a, I was the design lead on Eminem. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess Steve, I mean, I know you came into third edition with like wanting mm -hmm. to update a lot of the characters from their second their second edition counterparts. Yeah, I mean, we kind of fell into the whole process of, of the setting updating in a lot of ways um, because I came from a, I came from the, what a lot of people refer to as sort of the active setting approach mm -hmm. uh, to things from like Shadowrun uh, and the like, you know, where it was, it was all about the forward progression of the setting mm -hmm. and, and the sense that the setting itself had its own sort of story and momentum to it. Um, and there are good and bad aspects to that. And uh, when we f did, ended up doing a second edition of Freedom City, uh, it was, it was a relatively short gap. It was about three years uh, between first and second edition. Um, and it seemed like a good opportunity to move the timeline forward a little bit, update a few characters, add a few changes into things uh, and the like. Um, but once we had established that precedent, um, when it came to doing further things in the setting, particularly big things like when we did Emerald City uh, and later when we did the third edition of Freedom City, we, we were kind of to a swell, we weren't definitely stuck with it, but we were kind of on that train of, you know, okay, time has moved on and we need to update things and what's changed and uh, all of that. And honestly, had I known the setting was gonna be around for 20 years, <laughs> I <laughs> might have planned differently, <laughs> um, you know, because like, like the comics, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you, you try and create a certain amount of timelessness uh, for characters in the setting. Right. 
Um, and uh, so as long as we were working with the notion that things were happening and moving forward and that we were going to change and update some things, why not change and update some things uh, so far as that goes? And um, Crystal has done terrific with picking up uh, in terms of some, because we did a lot of things where we're like, oh, let's imply all of this stuff like the plot that's happening in Nether War. Um, you know, let's imply all of this stuff. Um, and then our schedule promptly fell apart and uh, things didn't come out in the right order and uh, follow-ups didn't really get a chance to happen. Um, and then Crystal came along and said, hey, why did you never do anything with any of this stuff? <laughs> I'm uh, so naive. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. I'm not sure where I've heard that same refrain in that same tone. <laughs> Maybe uh, you know online. <laughs> so I'm I'm really glad that we're getting a chance to actually do some of the see some of the stuff that we had planted uh, in the in those changes really come about. I agree. You know, Liz, a question for you was when it comes to sort of you know you grab these concepts and these ideas and these characters that are you know. Uh, in some cases, you know, I, I think that I, maybe I'm incorrect in this, but it feels like with um, when we think about mutants and masterminds that it's such a rich world of characters that do change and are so dynamic, even, like these these characters of, of great import and impact uh, on the world get old, they grow up and they change. Does that happen in other um, sort of... Uh, like other IPs, like other, like, are there these sort of, like, I, I sort of think of other things seem static, whereas GR mm -hmm. stuff seems a little more dynamic. Am I, I think, just... I think a lot of, um, well, I guess I can speak from kind of my, my own experience. Um, with, uh, with Pathfinder, we have uh, an adventure path line that, that is big, big campaign stories. Um, and there's kind of the question of, okay, if we have this big campaign story, and it's going to be this sort of event that's serious enough to threaten high level characters, which it kind of has to be, to mm -hmm. be a useful story at that level. Um, what's, what effect is that going to have on the setting? Do we assume that that happens or do we assume that it doesn't happen? Um, and how do we adapt the rest of the setting to it? And I think ultimately it's kind of a call really similar to what Steve was talking about of, do we want to have a setting that is evolving and is uh, changing in real time, where the the cost is that the you know the books that you put out two years ago are out of date and they're wrong now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I love Shadowrun. I've been following Shadowrun since I was probably fifteen. Um, but wow, mm -hmm. that's a lot of storyline to keep up with, and and sure I have is. fallen off the wagon a whole bunch of times. And so it's like I I recognize the engagement value of having that kind of evolving setting, but also the the costs and the, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, to, to, to put it really bluntly, like the barriers to entry that creates. So the same barriers that you see in getting into comics, um, especially these long running mainstream comics, yep. you know, I could go to the store and pick up a comic, you know, whatever X-Men comic is on the shelf right now, but boy, the last time I was reading was 1998. Oh, and yeah. I don't know that's, what's happening. <laughs> that's a terrible example though, because X-Men is the most soap opera-y. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> it really is, right. it is. But that's very true of, uh, and honestly, whether you stay with sort of a static starting point or an evolving plot line, the the, the eventual growth of the setting's lore is is a concern yeah. to barrier to entry because either way, you know, it, whether you are zooming in on a, a static setting and adding detail, or you're you're extending the timeline of a setting and adding events eventually you just get to the point where you just have such a vast body. Oh, right, it's an enormous body of law, right. And then if it's sort of, I think there's also a risk where even if you are sort of like zooming in and focusing on one place in time, you end up with the risk that the stories that you're telling don't matter. That you've got, you know, mm -hmm. you, oh, oh, this thing is threatening the world, except you know that it's not really because there's going to be another issue next month. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. It's just another kind of uh, a moment or a, an episode of the drama of superheroes. Um, right. Liz, mm -hmm. I have a question for you just from, you know, hearing kind of your uh, sensitivity that, that we all kind of share in that. Will you, if, when you're working on these projects, do you have moments or have you had moments? You don't have to get specific more. So I just want to talk about the, the space where you're like, I've got to pull the brake. 
I've got to say, this is going in a place where usability is off. The, the player's going to be lost. The GM's going to be angry. The you know, mm-hmm. um, and and can you unpack a little bit of the again, not specific projects, but more so just sort of that process of identifying when things have gone off the rails. Yeah, I think um, sort of my philosophy when when I'm putting some of this material together is actually to is to be a little minimalistic. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make a garden, but it's not my garden. I'm making a garden for the GM. And so I'm going to set the space up. I'm going to make sure that, um, you know, I put the parameters that need to be there for the space. Um, and then I'm going to put some seeds in. And some of these seeds are going to be really, really fun seeds. And I don't mind going down rabbit holes for some of these uh, because the people who do get them are going to find them something they can dig in and really, really build on. And the people who don't get them, they're just going to gloss over it. Um, and it's just going to be a little piece of the lore. So, um, but if I were to try and go in and, and detail out every single piece of everything, then I'm not giving any room for the GM or the players to really tell the story. It's not mm-hmm. my story to tell. I'm just giving you sort of like the the, the blank pages to, to fill in your own story and like a, the Mad Lib prompts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is, uh, it's one of the things that I've seen in both um, Crystal and Steve as well, just a, a real commitment to sort of stepping outside of themselves as conductors of a, of colors and shapes and let people sort of assemble them as they, you know, as they come across them. It's really um, mm-hmm. fascinating. I'm, I'm uh, you know, um, we do Brian Scott that? Bailey, I don't know who, uh, <laughs> who Little Q is, but hello, Little Q. Everyone say hi to Little Q. Hi, Little, hi, little Q. Q. Hi, Little Q. Um, I hope that is a child and not somebody who is just wanting to leave and can't. Um, let's oh, no. see. Um, oh yeah, you know, this is great. You know, uh, there are definitely some Shadowrun fans for sure. Um, he brings them wherever he goes. Yes, exactly. They find um, them. Yeah, and so uh, I am looking at, I can't believe the time flies when we are having such a great uh, uh, conversation about this stuff. And I know that there are, you know, uh, it's interesting too, but much like when you're looking at a, it is Brian Scott Bailey's kid. Good. Um, yeah, well, good. You can put that in a little cute scrapbook. Um, and the, the notion that we are in positions of sort of creating these places for people to kind of, stretch their their kind of storytelling prowess um Mm -hmm. you know i've had this debate with lots of people on the video game side of things is that like pound for pound toe to toe you cannot step to gms and people who are telling stories in the tabletop role play space like the like these are world-class world-trained public speakers uh trainers um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think of like a Pook who is uh, part of our community. He, uh, Mutants Masterminds, runs a, a server on Discord, a, a very healthy, vibrant uh, server. And he spent time, you know, with me and a couple other uh, Ding Dongs. And we had played through a, a Mutants and Mastermind um, a session. And it was fantastic. But one of the things that it was riveting for me was how good he was at facilitating and sort of directing and sort of. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and being open as well to the like, okay, you're doing that weird thing. I guess we're going there, you know, and it's sort of that fun moment of like, I got something on the man. Um, but there's really nothing like that in, in the world, as far as like what you can contribute mm-hmm. to and be a part of, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And the depth to which the three of you will go to think about the experience for the player for the you know i'm, I'm just going to engage at whatever level and the mm-hmm. gm and you know and the kind of the, the longevity of some of these um things can go on for i mean a long time right i mean what mm-hmm. for the three of you your longest uh uninterrupted uh session of playing like for instance uh for you know like w- one period and then over the course of specific to a a, a like a, an adventure or something Oh, uh. oh gosh i mean like longest ever um you know was like a marathon almost weekend you know Oof. i mean it was definitely it was in the it wasn't quite 24 hours but it was like we're gonna play all day and stay mm-hmm. up all night and you know just like keep playing this game you know but that was like a long time ago <laughs> 
<laughs> I have no tolerance for that. Yeah, anymore. back in back in college, I think the longest I ever ran was probably like ten hours, starting yeah. in like the evening and going into the wee hours of the morning. Right, but that is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and you know, like you said, time flies. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when you really get into it, um, you'd be amazed how quickly that time goes by. Absolutely. Liz, how about you? What's your what's your longest uh, one like one go session? One go session. I, I remember uh, at some point in late high school, my birthday party, which is usually around the Christmas holiday, so we almost always get it off. Mm -hmm. um, we we all arranged to stay at my parents' house and just played. We well, we tried to play games all night, but it turns out that that yours truly can't go without sleep and just falls asleep oh. eventually anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how about the so let's talk about the longest campaign uh, sustained campaign over time, like oh, over you know uh, months or or even I've heard years people have been playing. Oh yeah, definitely mm -hmm. years. Oh, um, I think my longest was my um, I, I still refer to it as my Marvel superheroes campaign, although it actually went through at least three different superhero game systems over the mm -hmm. course of its lifespan. Um, and it lasted a good eight years, I think, um, off and on. Eight pretty, years, pretty, wow. pretty steadily for about five. Well, so then you just take that character sheet and then frame it? I mean, so, what do you... Oh, I, I still have a big stack of, like, paper from it. Do you all, you know, like do you all have that kind of library and... of these characters? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've, I've got a giant orange bin right here of old games <laughs> I've run. Mm -hmm. I heard that bin noise. Um, <laughs> all right, so I've got questions, um, uh, really good ones too. Uh, Brian Scott Bailey says, are we going to see some cosmic space adventures coming uh, for Astonishing Adventures? Yes. Uh, I've actually, I just gave feedback to our author, Larry Wilhelm, who is in the middle of writing a Prodigal Son, uh, S-U-N, Nice. So that is going to be a cosmic adventure where you end up fighting uh, Black Star and uh, the Argents get involved and you're Ooh, trying good. to stop war between four different planets. Ooh. And you birth a sun <laughs> yes. that is actually like a fiery sun. <laughs> um, Jay Gray says, oh, this is interesting. And uh, um, this is, uh, do feel free, uh, Liz, to sort of say, I tap out on this one, um, but what is the most important distinction between your process for developing for a class for class based games versus character compiling based systems, i.e. Pathfinder versus m and m? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think it comes back to uh, how much I know the characters can do. So if I'm working in a class based system, I know exactly mm -hmm. what the characters are going to be able to bring to the table. And so I can write encounters that speak to specific abilities that I know are likely to show up. Um, and mm -hmm. I can really make you feel like, oh, I, I made the right choice. I get to use this thing. <laughs> Right. Um, if you're writing for fifth level players, you know, I know exactly. somebody's going to have fireball. Yeah. Right. Um, but in, <laughs> in really M&M, you know, are you going to be able to grow or can you time travel? Or can you turn invisible? Or, sure. uh, um, and so it really, that's where I have to step back and, and stop thinking in terms of pro providing um, interesting mechanical engagement. And instead, I really need to focus on the story. Um, and mm -hmm. in, in those places where the story becomes mechanics, so like there might be a hazard or a chase scene, there's mechanics to support that. But ultimately, it's, it's story first. Um, mm -hmm. and, and all I'm doing is, is facilitating and giving the GM the tools to tell that story with their players. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. Um, uh, yeah. Real quickly, just to some um, thoughts here, folks are saying, uh, my longest was two years, um, three and a half years, Pathfinder. Um, you know, folks are saying, yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're playing games longer than some of my most uh, important relationships. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's great here too is, uh, of course, <laughs> Jonesy says a four-year LARP. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's Man, dedication. Usually, usually I can only t stick to. Uh, usually I can only stick around for a weekend. <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of feel like at this that's point in time in 2020 that I, it's all been one long, real creepy LARP. Uh, oh. Yeah. Right. Uh, 
Let's see. Oh, love that my wife is grinning to play her space pirate again. Randall says, uh, I think the most important thing is uh, character, personality, and background, who they are, not simply what they can do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And that's actually really, really hard to account for as an adventure writer, because, you know, there's, there's at least some guidelines on what you might be able to do there's no way I can account for what your right. character is going to be like who your characters are going to be. And that's really mm-hmm. where the GM comes in and takes it from, you know, a fill in like a choose your own adventure novel to these kinds of stories that we tell people about for years and years. And we remember for, and that's why mm-hmm. we have that bin of past campaigns It's kind of because that GM uh, is really doing phenomenal work in hooking into these, these, stories that we have built there's no way i as a writer can can speak to that unless i have also dictated who your characters are and then it's just weird yeah mm-hmm. there's, yeah, yeah it's yeah. actually a fun kind of a fun coincidence that the adventure you wrote also has our first real dungeon crawl for <laughs> astonishing adventures <laughs> yeah that irony was not lost on me <laughs> <laughs> but but the way it's written is so radically different it's than it would be for different. Pathfinder or mm-hmm. D&D where you'd yes. have a very specific drawn out map here's your map yep here's the way yep. you're going yeah and this this, this, this room is... has this monster at this time and I love it. Uh, I I really do. Uh, I'm looking at the time. We are at 2:57. Um, there's a couple things I want to get in announcement wise, um, and I don't want to keep us on the hook because, frankly, the it's conversations like this where we just kind of get in the flow. We share back and forth, and we get excited and do the thing that you just really feel that thing I was talking about earlier. That kind of synergy. That kind of magical sort of connecting of the bits and the pieces um it's it's pretty remarkable to be a part of and i do want to thank everyone who's been asking the questions and sharing their thoughts um i do also want to say just as a very special shout out uh jay gray like your um uh, ability to grab links and share them <laughs> the moments after the week i mean it is like i mean if there has to be someone with a superpower. Yours Working on is- cyberpunk has its advantages. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Uh, super, uh, super pleased by that. And so, Jay, I, I think that we'll we'll collude off uh, off camera and think of something nice to send you. Uh, I don't know what it'll be. It, it may not be super nice, but uh, at least it'll be <laughs> sent to you. We got some extra t-shirts, right? <laughs> Oh, oh, t-shirts, with yes. all of these great oh, yeah. concepts for t-shirts. We've uh, got yeah, to be able to send true. some of those. Oh, yeah, we really do. We have a whole library. You know what we'll do? We'll get like five white t-shirts and we'll just kind of write some things on there for you. <laughs> yeah, that'll be nice. And it probably won't be offensive at all. Um, way better than a no prize. That's very, it would be, yes. I don't know that that is true, but I think, um, yeah, just uh, wear that and your mask um, and go shop. Um, I do want to say too that, uh, Liz, we've got to have you back. Oh, I'd be happy to. I just mm-hmm. wish that your name, uh, we had an alliteration, uh, because there's no days of the week that start with L. Um, so. Lens day. Lens day it is. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I, I am still furious both with Crystal and Steve for not preparing you for this brilliance. I, mm-hmm. I've got like a a sunburn from how amazing you are. Um, I do want to get some of this stuff off my chest. That is, uh, hey, Gen Con Digital is happening. We are going to be yes. there. We have, yeah. we're working on submissions now. So never fear. Uh, the deadline for when they just shut it down and we go live is the 20th. We are well ahead of the curve. There is going to be a uh, some masterminds panel discussion of sorts. Um, Maybe we'll do it on a lens day. I'm not quite sure, but we'll discuss that <laughs> off the air. Um, uh, in addition, uh, Crystal and Steve, do you have anything you want to share um, specific to Troy, did you want to mention uh, the Pinterest? Oh, son of a gun. That's true. <laughs> um, well, we had a whole shtick that we were going to do with that. Should we do that? you mind like hanging out for a minute? or? Do uh, you... Well, before we get into that, I also yes. wanted mm. to say... Uh, Priorities. So Steve, Steve and I, along with uh, that fan who's always hanging out, Owen Casey Stevens, uh, <laughs> were all on the No Direction podcast last week to talk about uh, yes. Green Ronin RPGs and so good settings. So we 
completely spaced on plugging that last week. If you haven't listened to it yet, go over to No Direction Podcast and check it out. They're, they're just a bunch of great people who've been doing this for years for Pathfinder, and, and they are looking to branch out and take a look at the age system and mutants and masterminds. So yeah, go great tell them you love Green Ronin games and tell them they're doing the right thing by by looking at all of our offerings. Absolutely. And I am, uh, you know, Jay Gray, you're making me super lazy because I'm like, well, I hope Jay posts the link to that. <laughs> if he doesn't, then wow. Well, then you're going to have to do it, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> me? What? I'm just the communications community engagement nerd. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we have uh, uh, state to claim to Pinterest. Um, we are doing a thing. I'm going to um, uh, bring up one of these things. We're going to play a quick game to round it off. It is, um, we're calling this um, Superhero. Let me get to it real fast. <laughs> get judgy. Uh, we're calling superhero. it um, uh, Superhero Noise Fight. <laughs> I'm going to share uh, an image. And from that image, I would like you to create a superhero or villain, your call, name that would be appropriate for that um uh, for that image for and essentially what it is is the noise that that hero and or villain makes mm -hmm. um and you make the call and so i'm going to pull up one at random i'm lying it's not random and i will share it and uh okay. folks who are in the chat you are welcome to brando cram beat jay gray oh my goodness this we're having a fight right now the, it's a link fight it's not pretty oh no <laughs> calm down guys it's come all right on, no, come on. <laughs> we do this every week <laughs> yes, we, we really you're do both, you, you're both pretty <laughs> you're both pretty all your links are both pretty you you've done the yeah okay so i'm gonna share this and uh are we all clear uh, about all right. the okay all right so don't be scared here it comes um this and you can play at home as well Oh, there we go. Screen sharing. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty standard, but the clouds behind it make me think it's it's some kind of stunk or skunk based villain. Mmm. Mm. Like, yes. like La Fume. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. I kind of I kind of want to bring the pink into it or something like that. I could like, see yeah. the, the pink being more like more. a like a perfume thing. I, so this is like mm -hmm. pew pew perfume. So right. like uh, maybe kind of like a Powerpuff oh, yeah. Girl direction. Sure, sure. I like fuchsia the fume. Okay. Yeah, fuchsia yeah. the fume is Ooh. great. It's got potential. Like a like a mad heiress to a perfume empire, empire. that's yeah. Exactly. Mad with power and odor. I still want to go with the skunk themed costume. Like sure. make her a Batman style villain yeah. where with no the powers. Ears and the skunk, skunk stripes, big yep. ears. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Kind, kind of Cruella de Vil kind of. Like right. a, kind of like a Catwoman vibe. Mm. Ooh, I like it. Except with like yes. Fear Master chemical weapons. Right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Hey, yeah, this is really good. I mean, there uh, we uh, uh, Jay Gray says actually, I'm getting pheromone powers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. Sure. Maybe a pink skunk. But do pheromone uh, powers go pew pew? Yeah. True. But, you know, I I, depends yeah. on the pheromones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, should we do maybe just one more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's bring yeah. it. Yeah. Let's, okay, let's do one this. One more. One more. Okay. Um, let me. I'm gonna unshare. And again, I shall randomly pick. Um, <laughs> the Mountain Dew Green needs to come into it somehow. Okay, all right. Well, well that's you know. where the stink comes in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, and uh, honestly, where like my longest sessions of doing um, uh, role, uh, tabletop role play have involved Mountain Dew, so. Um, the caffeine is very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there was Not a stink. <laughs> that I recall. Sometimes is the case too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, so that usually goes with gaming tables after ten hours as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so, um, Liz, uh, pick a number one through five. 
Oh, I don't have a D5. Come on. Nice. Oh, roll uh, a D6. Two. <laughs> okay. Oh, you know, you picked my favorite, and I do want to say that that was truly random. The other one I picked just because mm -hmm. I really wanted them to try to figure that one out, and they did, of course, so I'm foiled, but this one I am very curious to hear what you will think of this. Blorp. <laughs> Blorp. I'm thinking the Professor Cuttlefish. Mm. <laughs> See, I'm getting so you are like the real that, villain like, here. That is brilliant. You know, like a gelatinous, like, you know, <laughs> like a jello mold. Oh, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Or like the blobfish. Oh, oh that's yeah. So good. Yes. Blorp. Blorp. Like it just I mean, falls from the ceiling. Yeah, the blobfish is repulsive in the city, but at is in his native environment, like three kilometers below the surface of the ocean. He's actually quite handsome. <gasps> mm -hmm. Oh, that's so funny. He kind of, kind of unveils a little bit, sort of gets sort yeah. of uh, uh, un, un, undried or sort of, <laughs> I love it. That is so good. Juiced up, if you will. Yeah, all of his uh, powers come from decompression sickness. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, I have no skeletal. <laughs> 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 Uh, that's why he's evil now. He was handsome. He got netted mm -hmm. and brought to the surface by researchers where he turned into the blobfish. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, it. really, if that were a media campaign about me, I would probably have turned evil by now, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've turned evil just listening to it. Um, yeah, it makes me, it's a tragic it really story. Makes, it makes me think of there's a, there's a villain in the Big Hero 6 animated series called Blobby. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yes. Who's, whose powers being a blob that can mimic matter mm -hmm. <laughs> his nemesis is the bends somebody said oh no <laughs> i love that you kind of like poop, you don't read ahead you funny. someone's cheating and looking um so we uh we do have our pinterest up uh you will find us um look for uh search for green running uh we are going to add more stuff there uh we have got a special section section just for <laughs> that was coming out really weird we've got a special <laughs> section just for mutants and masterminds mm -hmm. um and we're going to be having more of this kind of fun and oh yeah the blob because boy do we have a lot of art <laughs> we're gonna need fan art for fuchsia la fume and the blob fish asap Light. Yeah, then exactly. then there people are definitely um oh yeah, absolutely. Well yeah, no Mountain Dew makes you gassy. A uh, Randall Cram. That is too much information, sir. Um let's see. Yeah, uh I I I'm shocked by the responses only in that we are so open and honest with, with each other. Maybe too honest. Mm -hmm. Um Gail Teen, a new hero high in role who is Claremont Academy's first stormer changed into living gelatin. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. I like it. Blorp is even a good name for that character. Yeah, Blorp. Oh, yeah. Who are you? I am Blorp. Um, <laughs> what do you do? I Blorp. Blorp. I Blorp. <laughs> I have the Blorps. Uh, <laughs> hey, the three of you, uh, Crystal and Steve, always a delight. Uh, Liz, a new delight in my life. You are just uh remarkable so fun um and the depth in which you can kind of share with our community and the the silly kind of deep questions about all of this stuff i think it really um it, it is nice to see one of us uh whom i didn't even know existed until today and so i am now your biggest fan oh um, <laughs> thank you so much and oh. thank you for crystal and steve for having me on today it's been oh, actually a whole lot of fun oh, good. All right, friends, we are done, and thank you so much. And how dare you, Jay Gray? Literally, I have not shared the link. I just <laughs> created this crap today, and he came up with a link now. That is just something. All right, mm -hmm. well, so I guess since Jay Gray is sharing all of our stuff, um, do me a favor. Uh, check out what we've got. Um, we've got a few different uh, – uh, there's, there's, a, there's a selection of – of noises. Uh, Liz noises has a cat there. I do. She's decided she wanted to go under my desk and chew on things, and it's not permitted, <laughs> and she's very upset mm -hmm. about it. But since now I've got her, I've got to show her off. She's yep. just such Freak a me out just ass. a little bit because it's a law of Zoom meetings. Yeah, you freak <laughs> out just a little bit because I am fighting my cat literally right now, and I'm like, I am two steps away from should not be like uh, up. I am wearing pajamas and. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and it's been a whole day of this. And so I was like, please tell me this is not on video um, because, you know, great. Um, anyway, thank you so much, uh, Liz, again, for joining us. Uh, Crystal and Steve, always a pleasure. Uh, we are done for now. We'll see you next. Uh, uh, for, we have this Friday, we've got our um, uh, Fiction Friday. And then again, Monday, we'll do meetings and Mastermind Monday. And who knows what it will bring. I mean, some kind of blorb, I presume. <laughs> blorb. Blorb. Hopefully more fan art. That's, right. Yes, bring some fan art. We're, I'm still waiting for the wig, <laughs> the wig on wig stuff. <laughs> this is the only <laughs> podcast that brings you hot wig on wig action. Action. That's true. That's right. or, or promises that he doesn't deliver fans. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs>